Welcome to South and Southeast Asia. By the 1200s, this area was old, and now they have collected three main religions that would soon dominate the area. Buddhism, Hinduism, Jainism. Billy Mays here with another fantastic product. And it's not that. It's a group of Vietnamese ceramics from the Hoi An Hoi period. That ranged from the 13th to 16th century. These Vietnamese pots painted in underglazed cobalt blue and that further enhanced and with overglazed enamel. These wares were shipped throughout the world as far east as Japan and as far west as England and Netherlands. Right. In Thailand, the Sakotai Kingdom also took in Theravada Buddhism, although Hindu shrines were also still constructed within the capital city. Here we have a seated Sakotai bronze Buddha. Uh, you could tell he's Buddha because of the long arms, the mudras, and the way his feet are situated in that stance. Course. Um, also, his elongated ears, the urna, and his way he's looking down upon the earth. Also, a very important um, symbol of him is a flame on top of his head. It symbolizes energy of light, of supreme knowledge from the crown of chakra. Uh, this flame in light is enlightenment, which is unlike a halo and its holiness. The Bodhisattva Evil Okite Shivara. I'm assuming that's how you pronounce it. Anyways, this is a Bodhisattva, and it's from the 12th century. It's gilt bronze, and not. It's from the Pala Dynasty. Anyways, it's besides the point. He Bodhisattva is basically a prince who is almost basically Buddha but to become Buddha he has to help people reach Nirvana well what makes him noticeable is see he has his little crown right here there's a bunch of jewelry around him but he also looks like a prince but this Buddha is different Oh, the Bodhisattva is actually different than anything. He's extraordinary. And the status of it proves it by right here, instead of an urna, if you look, it's supposed to be a third eye. What that third eye symbolizes is the ability to see in miraculous ways. A very, very distinguishable trait also is this right here, right in the palm of his hand. What's in the palm of his hand is a wheel, actually, and the wheel signifies Buddha, but in this case, it doesn't. It signifies the ability to teach the Buddhist truth. That's what makes this an extraordinary piece of artwork. Jahindra and Shah Abbas right here. It's also known as Jahindra's dream. All right. And it's a portrait of Jahangir and he commissioned it himself with the Savavid dynasty with the Persian Emperor Shah Abbas right here. Alright, it demonstrates Jahangir's sense of his superiority. Jahangir is depicted much larger than Shah Abbas right here. But Shah Abbas also appears to be bowing to the Mughal Empire, Emperor right here. Jahindra's head, if you look, is also de at, depicted in the center of this giant circle, which is a halo. Alright. Also, Jahindra stands on a lion whose body spans a vast territory. And if you look, this is the world right here. It, it's hard to tell, but it's the world. And Persia was right here. So it's saying that he basically conquered Persia and standing on it. While Shah Abbas right here is standing on like a little sheep. Basically something that would be beaten by a lion. Then. Oh, I, I forgot one thing. There's little angels right here. 
type things. Like, they're almost birds, but they they're flying. Ooh, get on. <laughs> anyway, this, this is Shah Jahan as a prince. What Shah Jahan is? He is the son of Jahangir. He succeeded his father, and then he took the title of Shah Jahan. Shah Jahan. But he was before that he was known as Prince Kurum. Anyways, Shah Jahan's greatest architect, well, artistic achievements were architecture, but painting was flourishing during his reign while he was emperor. But this portrait of Prince Kurum bears an inscription indicating that he considered it a very good likeliness of himself at age 25. This is supposed to be him at 25 right now. Um, all of his portraits depicts him in profile and the view that has least likelihood of distortion. If you look in the background, there's different like distorted things like it's all blurry and stuff and you're left wondering what these little things are in the background. But he's, if you look, he's holding an exquisite turban ornament right here. And he stands quite formally against this very dark background allowing nothing in the painting to compete for your attention. And if you look, there's, there's a little light around there, which is supposed to be like a little halo thing. So that's Shah Jahan. Skip a hundred thousand years into the future. I'm just kidding, I wish we could. But it's about three to four hundred years in the future, actually. This is Dharma and the God. Alright, it's a modern Indian painting. It brings new inception to heroic figures of the Indian traditions normally. Uh, Dharma, it's one of Indian, I mean, I'm sorry, it's one of the righteous duty or virtuous path or religion of choice in life. But as you can see, there's multiple heads and arms, which represent the multiple Indian religions that people can practice such as Buddhism, Hinduism, and Jainism. Anyways, as you can tell there's it uses symmetry and a symmetry around here. Ooh, kill him. Anyways, it uses it to fill the empty space and guide the eye towards this. It's the broke. <laughs> Anyways, it has. Oh my god. <laughs> There's a ton of religious <laughs> meaning behind this. But it's starting to show religious meaning in Indian artwork again because kind of lost it over time. But what you do see here is it's composite. I don't even care anymore. Which, <laughs> which means basically. Like how Anubis, back in Egyptian times, you know, Anubis was human, an animal, Horus, eagle, human, human. This is human, and like cow or bull. Alright, another modern work. It's called As If To Celebrate, I Discovered a Mountain Blooming with Red Flowers. It's by Anish. Kapoor right here. Alright. The red and Accor mounds right here recall the vermilion and other pigments beautifully piled for sale outside Indian temples. So outside like of t all the Indian temples there will be mounds just piled up in beautiful colors and that's what this is representing. Um, but other works it has no reference to India or Indian stuff at all. And Kapoor, so this is a little bit about him. 
he represented Brit Britain, where he now lives and works, at the Venice Biennale in 1990. It further complicated the issue of his identity, so his identity is kind of hard to figure out. And that's so far all we have for Indian artwork. Okay, you guys have been waiting for this one. The Great Taj Mahal. This beautiful white building that it's actually a tomb, but you know, we'll, we'll get to that later. Um, it was built between 1632 and 1648 by the Mughal ruler Shahad Jahan. Yeah, that 25 year old kid, him. Um, this building is actually a tomb for his favorite wife. So, based on that, I'm guessing he has many wives. He's an awesome dude. Um, the Taj Mahal inside has eight paradises, a plan named for eight small chambers that surround the interior. Um, I, one at each corner and one behind each in wall, a vault opening with an arch point portal. Uh, this is typical of Eastern Islamic architecture. Yep. That's the Taj Mahal. The beautiful the Taj Mahal. The beautiful Taj Mahal. Another thing, it's right behind the Jamal River, I think it's pronounced. Yeah. The, Jamal. The Jamal River. Remember that, people. Here's a few bloopers for you guys. We're awesome. Carlos, how'd this project make you feel? Tired. Beautiful. After our camera <laughs> messed up, I don't know if you can read the time. That's a 6.35, but it's an hour ahead, so it's 5.35 in the morning. Beautiful time. I'm yeah. starving. We've gotten absolutely so much done tonight. I don't even want... Oh, uh, school starts in a couple, not even like an hour to two hours. A few hours. Uh, yeah. But I'm not tired yeah, anymore. Not. We're just hungry. We're just happy to finally be done. Yeah. Thank you, Miss Price, for letting us use your camera. Shout out to you. Thank you guys for watching. Love you guys. Peace.